the third project that Lawrence and I have worked on together, combining creative writing and photography. The aim is to connect the, the writing and the photography elements as different means of expression um, and allow the visual and the verbal to work together and to inspire each other in some way. In terms of the photography side, the focus is less on the technical side of photography and more on using the camera as a means of expression. I'm interested in how we can use the camera to see things differently, to make the ordinary extraordinary, or to, to defamiliarize the familiar in some way. Um, like writing, we can use the camera as a means of expression, as a, a, a blank canvas to create something new. And I think the writing and the photography work well together in this way. The class is basically around creative writing and photography. I'm the tutor for the creative writing element of it. And uh, basically what we do is look at a number of themes, which is identity, home and place, and the participants in the class sort of write on those, maybe looking at significant moments in their lives. And then uh, Zoe with them works on the photographic element, which is to take a photograph, a number of photographs, uh, which again reflect what it is that they've, they've written about. I'm always amazed that once people are given an opportunity to reflect upon their life and their experiences and significant moments and events that have helped shape them to the person they are today, that they, um, they really very quickly open up and uh, write volumes and very emotional uh, stuff about their lives. And, um, and I think also at the same time that there's an element of trust builds up in the class and sharing and the other important element I think is just basically good crack so uh, I mean I think everybody has been enjoying it and producing I think really really valuable work. The Lock on the Lane. A stronger lock than any metal, a tighter hold and bigger deterrent, the awkward look and unfriendly stare. Everyone knows you just don't go there. Children may enter, they know not what they see. The toothless farmer, to them, whistling, always happily. The years on a man are an enemy now. 
To them he seldom speaks, holding all behind his brickless wall. The redundant farmyard once made more than a pound. Animals, machinery and laughter the sound. The stony path is fit for one car. You might start to go up, but you won't get far. Fifty-foot lorries, tractors and trailers, carrying materials not always known to the sailors. They come, they go. We think we know. Some say it's terrible, awful, a travesty, and all to avoid paying tax to Her Majesty. Springtime Blues I woke up this morning and spring had arrived, or so it seemed. My heart is heavy, my mind confused. My thoughts are with others. Others whom no amount of daffodils, chirping of birds and sunshine will have any impact upon today. My urge to help is strong yet of value to no one but me. I hear a lamb bleating in the distance, his cry for milk go unnoticed. A cup of tea is placed in front of me. My gratefulness for, for what I have returns to me. The time to hug my friend, my colleague, my neighbour will come, and it is then that my healing will begin. The class, inspirational, frightening, yet surprising, creative time. Out of the darkness and the gloom, the mountains and sea awaits. A walk in the fresh air, the scenery breathtaking. Waves crashing, good sounds. The sun comes out, there is always light. The freedom is glorious, whatever the weather. Good for the heart and mind, peaceful feelings. Newcastle County Down, a place I love. My caring hands could tell a story of pain and sorrow, hope and glory. I've laughed and cried, shed many tears with those I've nursed throughout the years. I've been blessed by some and cursed by others and held the hands of dying mothers. Throughout the years I kept up the pace, though it sometimes felt like I was running a race. I was in it for the long haul, for better or for worse. I hope I've made a difference to all I helped nurse. Survived. Dad gone, lost dreams, lost hope. Moved on, grown up, four adults, so proud, coped well, survived.
all things become clear. As morning dusts her golden light on Gullion, my name is called. She beckons me, stirring my senses and my soul. I will follow the lichen ditch to a place where my heart can be still. The delicate dew of primrose and violet wink a welcome from the ditches. Silver and gold, the brazen wind stands to attention. Ablaze with light, shimmering in the spider's weft. The returned swallows appear to dance, as if buffeted by the rising mist over Clahinia Bog. Far away, a donkey's bray echoes off the hill to welcome in the morning. The buzzard chick screeches for his breakfast. The fox cub tumbles from the cool of darkness into the morning sun. All have awoken, as has my spirit. I am alive, and all things become clear. Born of fire and ice, she rose, victorious from the ashes. Her legends abundant as the blooming heather, her secrets manifold. How many lovers have adorned her hills, how many warriors took refuge in her valleys. She shelters us still, soothing our souls. No matter what dominions try to lay their claim upon her, she stands free. She is her own ruler. Proud, true, rich, rare. Queen of us all. Her Majesty laid out before us, set in stone. Our first glimpse of her is our first sight of home. Many laws and dictators will come and go, yet she will remain strong. Only we who toil around her girth will really come to know her worth. No shackles of king, queen, or kaiser shall ever bind her, for she belongs to no one. Her rivers run free. How can I not have something to say when this mountain shows me her secrets every day, under each stone and flowing in each small stream? A millennia of legends waiting to be seen. For she is in my blood, in the very marrow of my bone. She is glorious, Slave Gullion. She is my home. My baby. Her eyes locked onto mine, a bond of love and affection, life's purpose defined. Spring in my heart. The new dawn has broken, light has overcome darkness once again. Out of the shadows of doom and gloom and dreariness springs forth the first rays of hope. Henceforth will flourish new life, blossom, colour and joy. Happiness replaces sorrow. Joy replaces despair. Laughter replaces tears. Freedom replaces the chains of drudgery and decay. Deep within the core, new life is starting to emerge, dancing and swaying in the glory of its existence. The birds proclaim the wonder and awe of creation. My voice proclaims the dawn of transformation. Everywhere, within and without, the world is bursting with possibility. Dawn opens the gate to morning, darkness abates. Crimson sun stirs and caresses, 
the sky with strokes of amber, gold, carmine. I'm glad I didn't sleep late, and I watch in rapt wonder as the miracle unfolds. Nature's spectacle holds a promise, not a warning. A new day, fat with possibilities, awaits. Strong together. A chromosome disorder? No. She is perfect, doctor. You warn me she won't understand. Then I will be her interpreter. You warn me she will be unsteady on her feet. Then I will hold her hand. You warn me she may never speak. Then I will be her speech. I am her mother. She is my daughter. I warn you, we are strong together. Uninvited Funeral Guest The Master raised his eyebrows questioningly at my request to attend the Lockery funeral. As the crowds gathered, I hid behind a grave. I wasn't supposed to be there, and I thought that the throngs that were supposed to be there all knew to look at me. As the service unfolded indoors, I meandered from ancient stone to ancient stone. I went unnoticed by the grieving masses. As the mourners flocked to the graveyard, I took up my former hiding place. Forbidden excitement was rapidly replaced with fear as my world upended. My legs took flight when the volley of shots shattered my world of nonchalance. My heart beat in my temples for the two-mile race home, with only one winner and one loser. Loch Melvin Clapping water noisily kisses the boulders. Clinking halyard taps the mast. Chirping birds fly all around. A symphony of sound peaceful and content. Nature's heartbeat, the lake, the wind, the birds. And I am peaceful and content, looking over the clouds and sun within the lake. I lift my face to the warm sun above. And when night falls, I turn my face up to the dark black abyss punctured by a myriad of brilliant stars, peaceful and content. My place, my lane. My lane, I call it my lane, but it's just not mine. There are three other homes there. The lane had dams and trees on either side, with overgrown briars, sometimes catching me unaware. Blackberries were also in good supply. There were potholes galore that housed the frog spawn. This reminded me of the tapioca my mum would make. John Tommy, GT, just opposite, lived opposite our house. It was even a smaller house with a galvanised roof.
Farther down the lane, an old lady lived. She always wore black. Her house was lovely. It was like a doll's house. I would be invited in for tea and biscuits. It was a great excuse to go to the well. Next door to our house was Lizzie. And Mickey and her daughter, Maura. I loved this house. The kitchen was painted in red gloss with a big open fireplace. The kettle was always boiling. I would get a job of blowing the bellus. Mickey always said I was a great wee dancer. And I believed him. And I'd dance a jig. I'd make up the steps, as you do when you don't know what you're doing. My house was the first one halfway down the lane. It consisted of two bedrooms and a kitchen, where my brother Patsy, my mother and father and I lived. This lane of mine was a busy place. Everyone was doing what they could to make a living on their small farms. At one stage the lane became more alive, because John Tommy fell in love with Maura. Maura was next door. He was nearly 60 and her only in her 20s. And as you can imagine, her mother wasn't too pleased. She was raging with anger. And as soon as he'd come home from work, he'd only get in the door when the stones would be petalled against his galvanised roof. You'd hear the noise a mile away. Johnny was getting sick of this and tired every evening. He started to retaliate with name calling. Her title was the Earl Badger. This was because of her white hair. It was real white. Well, he had a limp. I don't know where he got it. But now he was called the, uh, the Hoppin' Hoor. Every evening without fail, the riot would start. This was a great source of entertainment to others from the parish. They would use our loft as a viewing point, waiting for the action. The name calling, the stone throwing, and even the buckets of water they throw at each other. John Tommy could neither read nor write, but he went to work every day. He had a Morris Minor car and a bicycle. He would take the bike across our field. He'd lift it across the stile. Sometimes he'd fall if he had drinking him. He liked a few drinks on a Friday evening. Some evenings he would be washed of wear. You could find your breakfast on the lane if you got up early on a Saturday morning. A string of sausages, rashers, black pudding, eggs broken. He had a great selection. One particular visit to his house, where he had the pan on the fire upside down. He continued to put his fish on the pan, and as he did it rolled into the fire. I tried to tell him, you know, stop, but he told me to go home to hell. Maura brought him a watch. He was very proud of this. He'd wear it outside of his jacket on the sleeve that everyone could see. And all yet here was, I love Maura. And he did. Struggles. We all have our struggles, some big, some small, but we all have them and own them, one and all. For some, it's getting up in the morning to find a reason why. For others, it's smiling all day long when all they want to do is cry. For some, it's searching for light at the end of the tunnel. 
For others, it's accepting there is no light. We all have our struggles, some big, some small, but we all have them and own them, one and all. We struggle with bills, never ending through the door. We struggle with school and work, deadlines and pressure. We struggle with our health, checking every lump and bump, hearing stories of others and thanking God it's not us this time. For some, it's a struggle carrying the shopping home. For others, it's a struggle knowing there will be no shopping. For some, it's a struggle walking all the way home. For others, it's a struggle knowing they've nowhere to go. We all have our struggles, some big, some small, but we all have them and own them, one and all. For some, it's a struggle to watch a loved one pass away. For others, it's a struggle to show they care. For some, it's a struggle to fight injustice on behalf of others, to struggle with their apathy and lack of fight. For others, it's a struggle to visit and bury those who are right. We all have our struggles, some big, some small, but we all have them and own them, one and all. It's your struggle, your challenge. Find your inspiration and rise to it. Steve Gullion. Looming black against the sky, perched aloft above the land, watching over Amaz farms, like mother watches the child in arms. Eastward lies the Moran clan, westward Kavanagh's Monaghan. Dundalk's southern gleaming bay, northern rights and Grand Loch Nay. Watching these with unblinking eyes, coniferous coat that never dies, winter's come its cap of snow, the polished crown like jewels glow. People fresh from morning rise, look up at it with weary eyes, tell themselves the kind of day and go about their working way. A real clock. Hours and minutes, I love to relate. You know you're early or definitely late. Time keeps moving, it never waits on any person, colour or creed. It doesn't stop, how hard you plead. I'm better than digital, the old tick tock. If you don't do this, you're not a real clock. Revelation. A carefree and jovial air enveloped everyone within my immediate surroundings. Glancing around me, my gaze took in identical scenes. Each and every person was immersed in conversation with their respective parties, venerating the talent of John Richardson by exalting the gig that had just concluded in the atmospheric, historic and altogether inspiring venue, the Olympia Theatre. The infectious laughter generated by the act on stage spilled out onto the busy street, carried by enthused audience members. I too had been entranced by Richardson's comic stylings, but as I stood on the breezy, wet street on a bitter Friday night in November, my attention slowly fell away from my fellow revellers and settled upon the far side of the road. As I stood on the glistening footpath, bones rattling with the chill of the icy night air, Members of the capital city's homeless population were preparing their accommodation for the night in the recesses of City Hall, in the shadows of Dublin Castle. A lingering group of three attracted my curiosity, and I diligently followed every movement in what appeared to be a well-rehearsed routine. An elderly lady, 
identified a suitable site for their open air bedroom and signalled hurriedly to two male companions to join her, much to the chagrin of newly arrived site searchers. I was in that moment struck by the plight of the homeless population and societal indifference to this sizable cohort. I physically buckled as I stood watching an elderly lady being helped to surmount tall, wrought iron, unfriendly railings placed there in an effort to prevent rough sleeping. Lips trembling and heart clenched, I looked on, motionless, as she landed ungracefully on the inner side of the railings. Flailing, she found the bars and dragged herself upright, briefly resembling a prisoner as she peered onto Dame Street, awaiting the company of her two friends. Her five-foot frame knelt on the unforgiving hard steps and hunching over, she unfurled her time-worn and weather-beaten sleeping bag. Her two friends had by now joined her in the building's recess, but neither had a sleeping bag. Instead, they laid out sheets of cardboard on either side of the woman's makeshift bed. The three bodies cuddled together for warmth, lay down to sleep. I was shaken from my stunned state by the return of my friend. The theatre goers hadn't noticed the people across the road and the reality of their dire situation. They were still engaged in frivolous chat. Absorbed by the goings on of privileged lives, they failed to see three people fighting for their lives. The contrasts were stark. As I stood on that buzzing street, I saw the divide clearly between the well off on one side of the street who were by and large blind to the desperation mere feet from them. A desperation manifested in three huddled figures, materially poor, but giving life to each other by sharing amongst themselves all they had, their body heat. You send me a sign, sweet son of mine, to tell me that everything's okay, to let me know that you're happy and safe in your heavenly home far away. These wee copper coins that I find everywhere don't mean much to those who don't know, but to me they're a symbol sent from heaven above to help me when I'm missing you so. These pennies from heaven I treasure so dear, for I know you sent them to me. As a message to say, though you're far, far away, you're with me and always will be. I can't have what I need. I can't bring him back. I'm used to this feeling now. My son has left my life. Some days I just endure. Thoughts of my child, his face, his smile, his voice come rushing to my mind and the memories flood in. With them, the despair, a contraction of grief that no medicine can ease and no tears could tell. It strips me to my very soul and leaves me empty, just hopeless. I'm living, but not always alive. Someday, maybe, but right now, I'm in the space in between. She is my rock. She is my strength. I am part of her and her of me. I nearly lost her once and remember it so well. It was an awful time. But she is still here and I am so thankful for it. I never realised how strong she was until she became unwell. Unwell to the point that we thought we would lose her. 
And while we fell around her wailing, she remained stronger than us all put together. A warrior, really, although she would never admit it. A lady, a woman of few but well-chosen words. The level head, the sensible one. I never inherited those qualities. Mad McEntee, she says I am, not like the Finnegans at all. I continually seek her counsel. I value her words. I enjoy our time together. It's effortless. And if a rough word is had between us, it never lasts. We know too well that there's no mileage in it. I would lose my life if I lost her, and I pray all the while that she remains well. She never grows old to me. I love my mum. I found my place. I found my place, I heard myself say, as I took one look at the scene from the front door of this unfinished shell of a house. The fields rolled and tumbled in front of me, an uninterrupted view across the border and into County Monaghan. I can see Conqueror Woods from here and Broomfield beside that again, where my grandmother now lies. The sun is warming my face as I gently rub my pregnant tummy and walk around the outside of this house which we wish to call a home. There's not a sound to be heard, save for the birds singing in the hedgerows and trees. I walk up the back steps and turn to enjoy the view again. We'll take it, he says to me. Will we now, I say to him. How will we ever afford it, I wonder. This is it, Colleen. This is it, he says. And I know he's right. I found my place. We've found our place.